In this short video, we're going to talk about best practices for drawing graphs. Now, graphs are wonderful things. They can really help us understand new concepts, or they can help us demonstrate how well we understand something. However, it's important that the graphs contain all of the essential information. Well, what is the essential information? Maybe a few examples will help us understand. Here, we have a simple question. It's matching. You have six equations. You have six graphs. Now, when you look at this, you may think, hey, all of those graphs are the same. But they're not. They're all different. However, we don't have all of the information to be able to match all of the graphs. In fact, at this point, there's only one equation which can be matched to a graph. Which one is that? Well, look carefully at graph B. What is different about it? The thing that's different about graph B is that at the endpoints of the curve, there are no arrowheads. Every other graph has arrowheads indicating that the graph continues without bound. Graph B is bounded. It stops at that point right there at the left and the right. So now we go and look at the equations. There's only one equation which tells us that the graph is bounded because the domain is bounded, and that is equation 6. In equation 6, we're told that x only goes between negative 2 and positive 2, and then the graph has to stop there. So we can say that graph b is matched with equation 6. Now, by the way, this letter over here is a Greek letter, and we call it mu. I assume you've seen theta before, somewhere probably in trigonometry. Well, let's add some more information. Well, but before we do that, let's note that we need to have arrows if the graph continues without bounds. And we can tell the difference between a graph like A and B. Let's go ahead and add more information. What new information did we get? We got labels on the vertical and horizontal axes. Those labels are essential. They tell us which variable is dependent, which variable is independent. The dependent variable is on the vertical axis. The independent variable is on the horizontal axis. So now I can tell the difference between graph A and graph C. Both of them involve theta and mu, but in graph A, theta is the dependent variable. So it has to be matched with equation Five. Equation 6 we already matched with graph B. In graph C then, mu is the dependent variable, so that gets matched with graph, and with equation 2. All right, but we still have three graphs where the knowing the dependent variable and the independent variable it's just simply not enough information. Uh, it's always the same in D, E, and F, but uh, the equations 1, 3, and 4 are different. How can I tell which one belongs to which one? We need to add more information. So we must label the axis, but what more do we need? Well, now not only do we have a label on each axis, but we have a scale. 
That is, we have a tick mark on at least one on each axis, and we have some indication of how many units that tick mark represents. So in graph A, on the vertical axis, we can see that our tick mark represents four units. On the horizontal axis, the tick mark represents one unit. On the other hand, in graph E, on the vertical axis, a tick mark represents two units. And on the horizontal axis, a tick mark represents half a unit, because we have two tick marks representing one unit. All right, now that is a lot of information. It allows us to determine the coordinates of points on the graph. So for example, on graph D, one point on the graph has coordinates 2, comma 4. In graph E, there's a point on the graph with coordinates 1, comma 2. And in graph F, there's a point on the graph with coordinates 2, comma 2. With this new information, I can go back and I can try to match up the graph with one of my equations. So equation one, for example, will pass through the point two comma four. So we can match equation one with graph D. Graph E has the point one comma two. And the, that point satisfies only one equation. That would be equation four. When x equals one, y will equal two. So graph E, it's matched with equation four. And then with graph F, equa uh, the point is two comma two and that satisfies equation three. When x is two, y will be two as well. So we'll pair that with equation three and graph f. So now we know all of the uh, equations. And how did we get there? We needed to have the arrows. We needed to have the axes labeled. We needed to have uh, a scale indicated on both axes. What else could we do to make the graph even clearer or more useful? We could add a grid. We could either start, which is what I recommend, we could start by using graph paper or squared paper, or we could draw the grid ourselves. The grid really helps us see the coordinates of different points. We also could add a few more uh, tick marks or labels on the grid lines so that, uh, again, it's easier to read the graph. So in summary, what are our best practices for graphing? To be able to have the clearest, most useful graph, we'd like to use squared paper or graph paper. We want our graph to look clear. So if we have a line which is straight, let's take the time to use a straight edge to draw the axes or any other straight line. We want to make sure that we've labeled the axes. The axes are not bounded, so if they're not bounded, let's put arrows on them. We need to show the scale on each axis. 
And if the curve continues without bound, let's use arrows on the curve as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this short video on best practices for drawing graphs.